Hey folks, welcome back to Keith's Garage. Today is July 4th, a special happy July 4th to my American friends who watch and subscribers. Thinking about you today. It's been real hot lately. Very hot. We broke temperature records. Ever highest ever recorded temperature in Canada just in the last few days. About 120 Fahrenheit, 49.6 degrees Celsius. A little town called Lytton here in my home province of British Columbia. Took me about an hour and a half to drive to Lytton from here. I drove through Lytton when I brought this car home on the trailer. And uh, there's no invisible barriers when it's 120 in Lytton. It's hot here too. We, uh, I was driving home from work and we were close to 120. The temperature didn't change. It was killer hot. So what does that have to do with my old Mopar? Well, I'm not driving it as much. It's just too darn hard to drive. It's too darn hard, hot to work on. My garage is not air conditioned. So I get a little bit antsy. I want to do stuff, right? I want to work on my car. I got fans blowing on me, trying to keep me cool so I can work away. It's just rank in here. Stale, hot air. If you open the garage doors, the sun sets on that side of my garage. The heat comes through the garage doors. It's no fun. So I've been going out early in the morning. <laughs> Last Sunday I did that, I made a video for you folks. That was like five in the morning when I was going through McDonald's drive through And then uh, on Wednesday night, it had been a hot, very hot week. It was Wednesday evening and uh, I said to my wife, let's go out and get an ice cream. It feels like it's a little cooler. It feels like it's around 90 or so Fahrenheit. So let's go out and get an ice cream. It was at sunset. She goes, yeah, let's go. So we jump in the old girl here, my Chrysler, go down the hill, get an ice cream. And the lightning starts. We had a lightning storm. That night in my province of British Columbia, there was 29,000 lightning strikes. After an extremely hot week of weather, the forest is tinder dry. Everything is bone dry. We're breaking records and you don't want lightning. So a lot of forest fires started that night. One of them right in my town. We heard about it. Someone sent us a text, forest fire near our house, not far. As the crow flies, you could be there, in, I don't know, 30 seconds, a minute. So we decided to head over that way and drive over, we're eating our ice cream, and we're getting close to the fire. And I was shocked at how quickly it grew. It became a wildfire, and it was mostly sagebrush and on the ground and in the hills. And uh, the flames were big and they were savage. They were traveling fast, and it was scary. And we're like, holy crap, we got to get home. So I'll share you some videos I took from my car and a couple pictures. So after we saw the fire, we just bolted home. I don't think I've come up that hill home faster. I pushed the little girl up the hill fast. We're worried. We weren't evacuated from our area where we live, but the way that fire was traveling, all the lightning we saw behind our home, further up the hill above us, everything's tinder dry. We were scared. So we started packing, getting all our stuff and throwing it into our travel trailer. I've got a diesel, uh, a three quarter ton truck with a Cummins engine in, and I've got an RV trailer. We started packing our valuables into the trailer. You know, stuff that's irreplaceable. I have family heirlooms from the 1900 era from my family I don't want to lose. Stuff like that, right? You're grabbing your passports, your important papers. We had time. There's people that didn't have time. They were evicted and told to get out evacuation immediately. They didn't have time to grab anything. They're just grabbing their kids and they're jumping in their car. Where the highest temperature in Canada, where, where it was recorded this week in Lytton, the fire came through the town so fast, people didn't have time either. They had moments to get out and people died. The coroner's there now and they're finding bodies, unfortunately. Very sad. And our thoughts are with the people out there in Lytton who lost everything this week. So here we are packing up, putting everything in our trailer and I'm in the garage, I'm looking around in my garage and thinking, what can I, what do I need to take from my garage? And I'm looking and I'm going, 
It's all just stuff. There's nothing here I can't replace. I don't think I could find another 1938 Royal Coupe in Canada. There's just none around that was, you know, made, made in Canada. I was told 40 were made. But it's still, it's an object. I didn't buy this car because it was one of 40 made, and it's rare. <clears throat> I bought it because it looks great. I love to have a coupe. I love to drive it. I love to wrench on it. I love to show it to people, I educate people, make YouTube videos. That's why I bought the car. It was a good buy, and the price was right for me. I could replace that, yeah, with another car. So I'm looking around the garage, and my wife drives a little Honda Civic. She needs that to go to work every day. She can't drive this Chrysler Coupe to work every day. Neither could I. I wouldn't do that. I can't. I gotta drive the truck with the RV. Because we want the RV so we have somewhere to sleep and eat. We're gonna get, you know, evicted from our house. We need somewhere to stay. I mean, we can go to family for a little while, but like, that gets old <laughs> fast, right? You know that. So I was gonna take the truck and the trailer, my wife's gonna take her car, and I'm looking around the garage, and I'm closing the garage doors, and I'm turning off the lights, and I'm just taking one last look, and I just took a second to pause, a moment, and looked at my cars, and I thought to myself, this might be the last time I'll see these cars. And I've got so many great memories in this garage, and all the fun I've had working on my cars and making YouTube videos. It was a little humbling, but I left it to fate. I left, I left my cars. Were they gonna burn? Luckily, they got the fire out. Didn't come in our neighborhood, but it's still smokier than heck here. Really smoky, brutal. And it still is now as I make this video, the skies are filled with smoke. So I'm back in the garage this week, working away. What am I working on? Choke, high idle. Is it working? How does it work? I got a sys on six volt electric actuator for the choke. What does it do? What's it supposed to do? You know, it's hard to tell if it works because I'm sitting in the cab and I'm turning the key on and hitting the starter button and that's, when does the choke come on? And I don't have high idle. I, I don't hear it. The choke comes on, it starts, but it's really low idle and rough. We know that. We get um, uneven air fuel mixture flow to each cylinder when the engine's cold. I mean, even when it's 40 degrees outside, the engine is still cold in terms of how hot an engine normally runs. Um, so the fuel doesn't vaporize evenly. We talked about that in an earlier video. So I want to look and see, is my choke working? Is it getting voltage from the, uh, from where? From the battery? When? And my high idle cam, do I have one? Am I supposed to have one? Is it working? So let's go into that. Let's take a good look at something here. I think you might learn something about the high idle cam system. You might learn about the choke system. I learned as I'm going. So, and you're learning with me and I appreciate it. So here's the next video on chokes and high idle cam. Okay, I've set up to try and monitor my Sison choke to see if it's working, but I'm by myself. So I'm gonna get in the car and fire, fire it up. But I wanna try and see. When I turn my key on, nothing really happens here, but when I engage the starter button, and the power is going through the starter solenoid. That's supposed to energize the Sison choke, move this rod up in this position upward, and that engages the um, choke plate up here. So that's off, up is on. We're gonna also try and see if we can watch, we're looking for six volts on the multimeter there while I'm turning it over. So let's see what happens. Key is on. on. So here you can see decent linkage movement, yet the ch choke linkage is dropping again. It, it's coming off. I'm worried about it. I think it's supposed to stay up. I got some more research to do. All right. I'm going to show you some intricate details about the high idle system on your vintage carburetor. This is an example of a Mopar product and I've been struggling a little bit trying to figure out why I don't have high idle working in my car. 
I've verified that my Sysson choke seems to be working and functioning. You've seen that earlier. So when the Sysson choke comes on, it opens this lever and that closes the linkage. We've seen that function. Okay, so let's just uh, pretend this is mounted in a car and this is your throttle. When you open and close the throttle, you're moving this rod. That's wide open throttle. And there's closed. Now when you set your idle screw, there's a screw right here. You twist it in and you can see that the end of that screw rides on this little place here. So if you push it in, you actually open the throttle linkage slightly. You agree with that? We're all on the same page. So it'd be like opening the linkage mechanically with your foot throttle in the cab, but you're going to adjust this screw here with a screwdriver, turn it in, and that's going to force the linkage to sit somewhere in that position at high idle. Now, if you look at this, when the choke comes on, this little piece here spins up. If you look very closely where the screw sits, and hopefully you can see that, the screw sits right on that area there. But when I cycle the linkage, you'll notice there's a little bit of a cam ramp there, right here. There the screw sits right on the linkage. And then when the choke opens, that comes up and the screw sits on that cam ramp. Now you've got high idle because the this, this screw is now sitting further away, which is opening this linkage here slightly. Does that make sense? Idle. Let's see if we can just move it with the choke. I'm going to move the choke only there. It's sitting there. Watch the linkage. I'm not going to force it open. I just got the high idle force it open. Can you see that little bit of movement there? I hope you can. That little ramp there is giving me my high idle. Now, my carburetor, my 38 Plymouth, is not exactly like this. Sorry, it's a 38 Chrysler. Here's my ramp piece. And I got looking at it and I'm going, there's not much of a ramp here for the choke high idle. I got looking closer and closer. There's no ramp for my screw to sit on there to go to high idle. So I'm going to try and salvage some other card pieces. Don't know if I can use that ramp. I'm going to take it apart and try. My choke is working on my high idle. Can't function. See what I can do about that. Okay, let's look a little closer again at these parts. Here's my cam, and the ramp's missing. Here you can clearly see the ramp. A nice little step in the center there. That's a head scratcher. This one is not going to work. You know, I'm never too proud to admit when I learn something new, because I don't know it all. I'm learning as I go. And lucky for me, I have right now about 1,200 subscribers watching me learn. So we all make mistakes. Now, in 1938, the engineers may have not been where my brain is today on high idle cam, because I'm not convinced in 1938 this car was supposed to have it. Maybe it was, but what I do have is a throttle cable. So when I start my car, the choke's coming on. We've seen that, we've witnessed it, that's working. But I don't have automatic high idle kick down. Maybe they never had it in 38. Maybe someone can tell me. Does their car have it? But I can start the car, give it a little gas, and while I'm revving it up, pull the throttle lever out and have my high idle that way. So let's try that. So I don't really need the high idle cam. You know, maybe in 38 they didn't have it. I don't know. Anyways, that's working. So I can do that if I want. There you go. I'm humble enough to admit that I'm, <laughs> I'm learning. But it was interesting what I found. Now I know how it works. Maybe you do now too. You can look at your linkage and see, do I have a high idle cam or not? And is it working? I'm not sure I need to get the welder out. This is going to work, I think. Just got to remember that it's there.
I've got my parts book. Covers both my P6 1938 Plymouth and my C18 1938 Chrysler. How handy is that, eh? So I go to the carb section. I want to show you something here. See up here, it says P6. My 38 Plymouth is a P6. There's the carb ramp, the high idle ramp. You can see it on the linkage there. You can actually, they drew it in there. You see that? But this doesn't cover a C18. Now I know that the, um, the 38 Plymouth also has a cable for high idle if you want. So I'm a little confused why I have the high idle ramp if you have a cable. So they did in, invent this before 1938. It's proof right there. Now I go over a page to where it says C18. That sure looks like my cam right there. I do not see a ramp on that anywhere. They didn't draw it anyways. So maybe someone can help me understand that. S5, that's a DeSoto C18. That is the Chrysler Royal. We know it has a throttle cable. It's listed in the parts too. Down here somewhere I saw a throttle hand control. So I guess you don't really need the ramp if you have a hand cable. But why does the Plymouth have it? What's going on here? It's not making sense. If somebody knows, let me know, please. So I got out my original 38 shop manual to try and wrap my head around how this little device here, this is the actual Sisson choke, how it works. It's a spare one. They don't do a really good job explaining it in the manual. There is a service bulletin that I've seen uh, that Chrysler dealers put out to teach people how to actually work on the Sisson choke system. They didn't really talk about it in the manual. So I guess they assume you already should know. If you're working at a dealer, you should know this stuff. And um, I did look up in the schematic. It's not really a schematic. It's a uh, wiring illustration in the book. And it does show voltage going to the Sisson choke off of the starter solenoid. So you're only getting voltage going to this point right here, six volts, while the starter button is engaged. While you push that starter button in the dash, it's sending six volts to the coil. There's a little coil inside of here, and you put six volts to it, it energizes and it pushes a lever up. Then the six volts lets stop as soon as you let go of the button on the starter. But I don't think this is supposed to drop. I think it's supposed to go up. That's what engages it, and it stays up. Inside of here is a, a bimetallic uh, thermal springy thing, that's a technical word, eh? And as it heats up, it sits on your exhaust manifold, as it heats up, it releases tension on this and allows it to drop. Mine seems to be dropping, as soon as I let go of the starter switch, it just drops again. It's not supposed to do that, I don't think, unless it's already hot. So, I got some work to do. Maybe you should go read that service bulletin. Hmm. Okay, you're sitting on a hard surface here. The spring sits like that. It's about 80 degrees, 75 degrees Fahrenheit right now, and that's where it sits. All the movement I'm going to get. Let's put this thing in the freezer for a while and see if the position of this changes when that thermo thermostatic spring there in the bottom is colder. All right, I've had this in the freezer for a couple of hours, and it seems to be sitting a little higher than it was before on the counter. This bimetallic spring in here should be opened wider, apparently. It's time to put it on a hot plate, see what happens. All right, I just took this off the stove. It's hot, so now, it's going all the way back down level because it's hot. So when you hit the key switch, every time you hit power, I get it now, it energizes the solenoid inside of here, which is a coil, which makes a magnet, which pulls this up. But as soon as you let go of the key, it's going to drop to where it needs to be, depending on the temperature of this, this particular spring right there. 
So the colder it is, it goes up to full choke, and then it drops somewhere about there. We saw it after I took it out of the freezer. Um, when it was sitting at room temperature, it was somewhere around here. Now that it's hot, it's all the way down. So if I was to start this car today and the manifold was hot, this was heated up from the exhaust manifold, as soon as I hit the key switch, it would go up like that. As soon as I let go of the starter, it would drop all the way off and there'd be no choke. And that is dependent on this bimetallic spring right here. As it gets hotter, I think it comes, uh, it shrinks together as it's hotter and it's colder, it's wider apart, I think. So yeah, there we go. Pretty cool. So I think the last thing to do would be fitting uh, to teach you how to adjust the choke. Because if you don't have the linkage set up properly, everything we talked about is useless. It doesn't work right. So you'll, you'll notice that in the, in the tooling, they talk about uh, setting the choke, you need a special tool. This is it. This is not the tool, I made my own. It's a piece of wire, it's just a piece of little bits of bailing wire, I cut it off and bent it. You're supposed to insert this special little tool, there's a little hole down here on the shaft. Try and get closer. Can you see it? I just put it into a little hole. You basically move this until there's a little hole in the, uh, the shaft of this thing. And you just put the pin through it, it holds it in place. See it there? little hole goes through there the wire holds it in place now we're to set the throttle to about a quarter open so I'm going to use my throttle control cable and I'm going to open the throttle to about a quarter or maybe about there okay next we're gonna loosen this nut right here it sits on the shaft of the choke. I'm gonna loosen that off. So that the and we've got this locked with a pin, right? This is in through the shaft. So now when we move the choke link, it's just gonna spin on the on the shaft there. Okay, so now that it's loose on there, I can move it on the shaft, but the shaft is not spinning. That's why that little tool, piece of wire we stuck in there, we're gonna open the the choke, we're gonna, sorry, close the choke completely all the way up to that position and then we're gonna tighten that bolt down so it stays in that position and then we're gonna uh, remove the uh, little special key and uh, we're done. So I gotta put the phone down and do that. All right, so the choke has been set. In theory, when the choke now is energized, it goes up like that and it'll drop down currently to that position. If it was colder, it would stay in up high like that and my choke is closed. There it's open. So I, I think we got her. It seems to be working. I'm gonna fire it up and try it one last time and call her good. Okay, let's watch the choke like it and see what it does. And that's what happens when you forget to close your throttle cable back from a quarter open. A little panic move. It wasn't high idle, it was a quarter open. Okay, so it's off. Throttle cable is fully released. Let's try it again. See if we can see that cable and see what it does there. It's a rod actually, it's not a cable. I don't know, seems to be working. I think we're good. The only other way to test it would be on a really cold day outside. Maybe I'll add a video in December. Hope you guys learned something today. I know I did. I learned something new today. I knew that much about these jokes earlier today, how to set them up, how they worked. I learned about high idle cam. I still don't know the answer. Why? Why does my Chrysler not have an idle ramp? I'd like to know. High idle speed ramp. We'll get to the bottom of it, but have a good one. Thanks for watching. Happy July 4th.